Welcome everyone to this week's edition of the Extracellular Vesicle Club. I'm very pleased to say that this, uh, this week's meeting is a collaboration of ISEV uh, with GYVEX. Our speaker is Marta Mon Monjuy Tortajada. Uh, she's a postdoctoral researcher these days, and she is working in the, in the uh, German Trials and Pujol University, University Hospitals in the cardio cardiology service, okay? in the laboratory that is led by Dr. Dr. Anthony Valles Genis. But she did the, the already the she's working with the cellular vesicle, but she did also the she did she, he, her PhD also in extracellular vesicle. So he she already have a, a, a very good background in extracellular vesicles. She he did, uh, she did she, his PhD in the laboratory of Dr. Francis Francis Borras in the connection of the extracellular vesicle modulation of immune uh, response in the concept of mesenchymal stem cell. So, Marta, is your time? So, thanks, Juanma, for this kind um, introduction, and also to Ken for the very nice initiative that is um, the X Club. So, I'm going to present you our latest paper that we um, published, which is um, Local Administration of Porcelain Immunomodulatory, Chemotactic, and Angiogenic Accessory Physicals Using Engineered Cardiac Scaffolds for Myocardial Infarction. And the first thing I have to say is to welcome everybody that's joining, uh, either if it's morning, um, afternoon, or night, <laughs> depending on where you're based on. Uh, we are currently based in uh, Badalona, which is a city right next to Barcelona. We are up here in the mountain at IGDP, which is the German Strias y Pujol Research Institute. We have this building on the right, that CMC, which is um, the animal facility that is brand new. We work from zebrafish to rodents to pigs that you're going to see later on. And we work together with the German Strias y Pujol Hospital, which is a, a, very, a quite important hospital in, in the area covering Badalona and, and part of the, of the northern part of, of Barcelona. Uh, so we work with the cardiology service of the uh, German Strias y Pujol Hospital, where we have patients that suffer from a myocardial infarction. Um, in these patients, this ischemia reperfusion injury causes death and necrosis in the tissue that uh, leads to first infiltrating leukocytes that are needed to clear out all the dead cells and debris and promote inflammation that is necessary for the repair um, and scar formation mechanisms, but that can also lead to then cardiac remodeling as the heart is trying to adapt to this loss of tissue and then lead to heart failure. One of the important things is that um, this switch from the initial pro-inflammatory phase to the pro-reparative phase is fast, because if this inflammatory phase is too long, so it's uncontrolled, it actually enlarges the injury that was initially caused by ischemia, it impairs tissue repair, and promotes more fibrosis than cardiac remodeling. So if we are able to switch up from this inflammatory to pro-reparative phase in a faster way, we would be able maybe to reduce the scar size so to avoid this heart failure because of the um, cardiac remodeling. One of the ways of doing that, we believe, is by the use of MSCs or their released um, accessory vesicles. The precedence that we have is in our group uh, working uh, throughout the years with different strategies for um, cardiac healing after myocardial infarction, from the definition of different types of mesenchymal stem cells with regenerative properties to strategies consisting on the transposition of an adipose graft, and to the latest um, being uh, the um, the use of a scaffold with mesenchymal stem cells and a peptide hydrogel that we've already uh, shown in the swine MI model that it's able to improve cardiac function to diminish fibrosis and infarct size and also reduce activated T cell infiltration, which all led to a uh, phase one clinical trial that just started last year, the periscope trial, and that of which we will have the final results um, next year. Um, ne nevertheless, in all these um, swine studies, what we could see is that very few MSCs actually engrafted. And so it got us thinking what would be the uh, mechanism of action. Given that um, mesenchymal stem cells are known immunomodulatory um, uh, towards very different effector um, immune cells, and also are able to regenerate different organs, but at the same time, they've shown regenerative potential in those tissues and organs that have already regen regenerative potential. 
and it looks like it's rather than their own proliferation or differentiation, what they actually do is to promote the endogenous re uh, regeneration um, uh, potential of the tissues and organs to regenerate themselves. That might explain why in the case of the myocardium as the adult heart has a very um, limited regeneration potential, the different approaches that have been taken are, um, are not are actually not very, um, have not very good results. Then one of the explanations might be actually by their secretion of different factors. Um, in a broad separation, we would have either soluble proteins that would have been uh, so um, cytokines or growth factors, and then exosomal vesicles that would be both exosomes and microvesicles. Um, that this necrotome is actually uh, been shown to um, be very similar in terms of functions that they have um, as, as their parental cells, such as um, they're able to uh, reduce the oxidative stress, to modulate the immune system, to promote survival and cell growth, and also to attenuate fibrosis. Therefore, we wanted to first study um, which part of this secretome was most active, as these MSCs are, seem to act in a paracrine way rather than um, differentiating themselves, as I said before. And um, amongst these, uh, we focused on accessory physicals, as I guess many of you do. The reason uh, for that is in terms of uh, um, advantages. If we come, if we are would compare them to cell therapy, would be the first one that they, as they are very small, they would have better access and biodistribution and less risk of, of vascular occlusion compared to MSC therapy. Being non-viable and so not replicating and not influenced by environment, they would be safer and unchanged by this inflammatory environment that they would encounter once administered. They have this um, package and protected bowel molecules structure that um, also being a source of biomarkers for many diseases, in terms of therapy, they would be able to be targeted and to have all these protected molecules delivered to targeted cells. And in terms of availability, they would be easier to store and handle with a standard shelf life compared to live cells that you have to administer to somebody that just um, um, goes under for a surgery or for um, for a catheterism. So um, we focus our study in these exosomes and microvesicles, and to have in mind that we might also have a study bodies, taking into account that we are working with cell cultures without any type of phytocytes. Then the first issue that we encountered when working with EVs was which type of um, isolation method to use. Um, the first one, of course, was um, to think about differential ultracentrifugation. It is the one most used by everybody in the field until now, at least. And uh, the problem that we saw with these is that it actually, because of the very high centrifugation force, it actually pellets um, all EVs um, together with aggregates. It um, disrupts EV and integrity, and you cannot separate actually. Um, the, the soluble proteins and aggregates from the EVs. So then we focused in uh, the combination of ultrafiltration and size exclusion chromatography to study both the EVs and separate it from the soluble factors or proteins to know which um, fraction would be more interesting um, as a therapy for myocardial infarcted um, patients. Just some of the publications in which we studied these um, different um, fractions in case you're interested. Um, as a summary, uh, we would do the size exclusion chromatography of um, conditioned media um, and that would be concentrated by ultracentrifugation from the umbilical cord mesenchymal stem cells initially. And we could see that these EV fractions that we know they are because of the positive um, labeling of C63 and C90, for instance, as they are EV and MSC markers, uh, are separated from the non EV fractions containing the most um, protein content. As you can see here by MTA, but especially by cryo electron microscopy, the EV fractions do contain these EVs with this round shape and around uh, 50 to 200 nanometers in diameter, while the non EV pool was actually devoid of any um, EVs and was mainly just protein, as I said before. We analyzed the function of these different um, fractions. So the first target would be macrophages, as they would be the ones arriving to the myocardial um, infarcted area first. Um, actually, the first would be M1 um, 
uh, uh, macrophages as they would be the one um, producing the initial inflammation, and then a switch to the M2 phenotype. We wanted to know if we could do this switch from M1 to an M2 phenotype with the EVs or with any other fraction, as they would be both necessary, as M1 would promote more angiogenesis, M2 would promote more the, um, the, the fibrosis, but also resolution of, of inflammation. So what we did was to compare the three different stimuli leading to either M1 or M2 repair or anti-inflammatory phenotypes, comparing that with um, monocytes stimulated with EVs, non-EV fractions, so mainly proteins, or the conditioned media, so the unfractionated supernatant. As a summary of the, all these um, graphs, what uh, we could see is that while monocytes remain non-polarized by EVs, they actually um, turned into an M2-like phenotype as they were expressing um, C163 and 206, but no CD80. And they did produce a bit of TNF alpha um, and no IL-10. So we could say that this non-EV fraction was more producing an M2-like phenotype, but not EVs um, compared to other, um, other published data, actually. We also looked at um, B cell um, regulatory functions. And what we could see here is that while um, EVs um, did not switch the B cell um, phenotype, not in terms of uh, non-switch memory, switch memory, or neither um, BREC um, functions, we could see that the, the protein fractions and also the unfractionated media was the one most resembling the MSC um, functions, leading to a uh, reduction in non-switch memory um, B cells, switch and memory, and also inducing um, uh, also um, BREC um, cells indicating that the B-cell plasticity was actually mediated by, by MSCs would be independent of the, their EVs, but actually because of the proteins or soluble factors that uh, MSCs would secrete. We also wanted to know what would be the, the effect of the EVs and other fractions on T-cells, because they would be the ones infiltrating the myocardial infarcted area um, together with the second wave, let's say, of macrophages and be responsible of, a continue, of continuing the inflammation on site and also um, continuing the fibrosis, fibrosis um, process. So what we did was to mix EVs and or the protein fractions with stimulated T cells. And what we could see is that EVs were the ones only able to reduce the proliferation of activated T cells. You could also see that this was in a dose dependent manner when EVs were then uh, further concentrated. And to our surprise, um, neither the unfractionated condition media nor the concentrated condition media and neither the ultracentrifugated pellet were able to reduce this um, proliferation of stimulated T cells. This indicated us that in the context of chronic or so after some hours or days from the um, for, from the from, from the myocardial infraction, maybe the EV fraction would be the most indicated um, to, to promote this immune modulation. Knowing all these and with the accumulating evidence supporting the potential of extra vesicles from mesenchymal stem cells as therapy for cardiac healing after myocardial infraction, we wanted to know um, how to develop a better therapy for, for myocardial infarcted patients. Nevertheless, as we've seen, neither their therapeutic mechanisms nor their efficient administration are fully elucidated, as we didn't still know if they would actually have an effect, given that they would have an effect, at least in vitro, with um, T cells, but not so much on um, macrophages or on B cells, at least with our um, experimental setting. So our objective was to develop a cell-free cardiac raft for the local delivery of monthly functional swine and mesenchymal stem cell EVs, envisioned for immune modulation and cardiac repair after MI. Why is that? Well, our de desired features um, for, uh, for an efficient um, therapy, um, and we do that in the swine model with um, porcine um, MSCs to avoid the channel. Um, the possible um, uh, artifacts from deriving from um, channel reactivity would be first to have a local release of MSC EVs. The reason for that is that this would allow uh, localized effects and also um, to reduce 
the amount of EVs needed for each dose as it would be a high dose um, administration as it would be a local administration. The second one would be to be in immunomodulatory as we want, as we are hypothesized that this switch from the inflammatory to the regenerative phase would be beneficial in this case for, for cardiac healing. And the third thing that we would desire of this um, therapy would be that it would be triggering the endogenous regeneration of repair mechanisms. For this to happen, we need the recruitment of progenitor endothelial cells and promotion of angiogenesis as it's the first thing that the tissue needs after ischemia. And then the recruitment of regenerative cells such as um, mesenchymal stem cells to promote the regeneration of, of the tissue from, by the host itself. To do that, the first thing that we did was to isolate EVs by sex exclusion chromatography as after the ultrafiltration of, con of conditioned media from mesenchymal stem cells, from cardiac adipose tissue, from healthy, um, from healthy pigs. Um, we first looked at which markers we could use because we are working with well, with ticks, so um, maybe um, our reactivity of antibodies well, it's, wasn't the best. And um, what we could see is that the best markers that we could use for the, in, in this case was the markers C63 and CD44. They were the ones giving us the best, um, the best signal with our EVs. So it's the one that we used regularly in the lab to um, detect the EVs in the fractions of BISEC. And we could see that it was um, um, that they were isolated and separated from the bulk of the brain. On the right, by cryon electron microscopy, you can see the typical images of EVs as they are around 200 nanometers, both by um, cryo electron microscopy and also by NTM in diameter. They are roundish and also have this um, membrane bilayer. What we first looked at was their immunomodulatory potential, as I just said. And what we did was to um, see if they were able to reduce, first of all, the proliferation of PBMCs coming from porcine whole blood. In, in figure A, what you can see is two different um, donors or uh, um, T-cell responders that um, are, would be uh, responding to two different batches, number one and number two of EVs. What you can see is that while both batches behave in a very similar way, and both batches are able to, um, to reduce the proliferation of stimulated PBMCs in a dose-dependent manner, it really depends on the state or on the, res on the response of, of, the different, um, of, the, of the different PBMCs or on the different donor to the amount of, uh, of, of inhibition of proliferation that EVs are able to do. Then in terms of uh, cytokine response, we could see that they are that EVs are able also in a dose dependent manner to decrease the amount of pro-inflammatory cytokine production. So for instance, um, interferon gamma, TNF alpha, and IL-12 were actually reduced. As you can see, IL-10 is also reduced, and we speculate that this is because of uh, or is resulting from the um, the, the decay in uh, IL-12 and uh, interferon gamma, they are both inducers of IL-10. And that's why here we don't see any. On the other side, both IL-6 and IL-8 were not changed by, by the addition of EVs. Then in terms of angiogenesis, what we did was a battery gel um, angiogenesis assay in which um, outgrowth endothelial cells which are a type of progenitor endothelial cells coming from whole blood from healthy pigs, were isolated, were put into the mitral gel, and then increasing concentrations of EVs were added into the wells or BEGF as a positive control. As you can see in the images, and then on the right as quantified, both the number of nodes and the branching length would be increased, indicating an increase in angiogenesis of um, outgrowth endothelial cells when increased, increasing doses of EVs were added, indicating so far that EVs are both immunomodulatory and um, angiogenic, something um, uh, that would indicate their potential in, in, in the context of an ischemic um, injury. Then we wanted to know if these EVs are able to recruit um, allogenic cells. For that, we did uh, this migration analysis in agarose spotocytes. 
in this case, what you do is in one, uh, one well, in a six well plate, you put there different agarose spots. So they are basically five microliter agarose spots containing either buffer or um, increasing concentrations of EVs of, or your positive control. For instance, VEGF in the case of endothelial cells. Then you pour over the cells. And so as they can interact with any of the spots that are present in the well, then they decide if they want to go into the agarose spot or not. If you can see here on their left, we would have the control. So agarose spots containing only buffer, in this case, just um, sucrose. And what you can see is that the cells actually don't go into the, into the spot, which would be in the right, as it would require active migration and also um, the digestion of the agarose to get in. But when EVs are added, cells actively migrate into the agarose spot. And when more EVs are added, they actually go inner into the spot, as you can see on the right. In this case, then you can see um, whether this movement is, um, has any direction, which actually it did. The cells um, that were in the border of the agarose, as the agarose doesn't allow the diffusion of the EVs outside of the spot, all the cells that were touching into the, into the spot were actually getting into the into the the how do you say into the spot into the agarose and also it was a significant Euclidean distance so it wasn't just um, random uh, movement but actually directed into where there were uh, more EVs. This also happened with awkward endothelial cells as you can see here in the control spots there were no cells getting in uh, and uh, in the remote areas you can see all the movement is actually random but in, when they are in contact with the spot cells, get into the um, into the spot and with a clear um, directional movement towards the center of the spot. Knowing all these, we had all the potency um, that we desired from the from the EVs. So the next step was to engineer the cardiac scaffold to be able to do this local delivery. To do that, what we did was the desterization by detergent based. Um, uh, protocols of both pericardium and um, myocardial tissue, um, and afterwards doing a lyophilization and irradiation to be able to um, do a storage uh, long term. So it would be like an off the shelf product. As you can see here by a scanning electron microscopy, after the sterilization, the scaffolds maintain the ultra, their ultra structure, but on the right, you can see how they are absolutely devoid of cells. As you can see, no nuclei stain with Dabi. Um, what we already knew is that these scaffolds, as uh, we studied before by our colleague um, Isaac, um, is that these scaffolds maintain their ultrastructure, they are uh, macromechanical and micromechanical scaffold properties, although actually the myocardial um, scaffold was a bit more stiffer than the, than the native tissue. That two accelerator matrices had enrichment of matrisome and uh, cardiac star matrix components. So in terms of composition was also um, um, having all the ECM properties of a cardiac um, of a cardiac tissue. But at the same time, um, as before, the pericardial tissue looked like a better option as it had um, higher number of of matrix um, proteins and also demonstrated better cell penetrance and retention, maybe because of the bigger pore size. What we did next was to fill these cardiac scaffolds with the EVs. And to do that, we did a mix of the EVs or sucrose in the case of the control um, scaffolds with a petrate hydrogel that is able to self-assemble. This mix would be poured into the cardiac scaffolds and this way would they would be rehydrated and also filled with the EVs. The jellification of the petrate heart gel would be promoted by addition of salts. And so the EVs would be inside of the scaffolds, as you can see here by um, confocal microscopy, in which you can see the EVs inside of the scaffolds as stained by um, pKH26. Also, a scanning electron microscopy, you can see that compared with the scaffold and hydrogen alone, in the cases of scaffold with hydrogen and EVs, they are really um, um, visual, visually um, uh, um, present in the surface of, of, the hydro, of the scaffold and hydrogel, even though they were um, actually washed 
three times very thoroughly and Davies would still be with the scaffolds. We wanted to see if um, this is, um, EVs would be in the scaffolds also in vivo. And for that, what we did was to stain them with an infrared dye. In order to avoid the aggregates of dye um, after, the, after the labeling, what we did actually was not to stain the EVs, but the producing cells. So uh, at the end of the process, as you can see here in the sec fractions, we would have EVs that would be stained by um, near um, 815, and the dye would still be embedded in the EVs after concentrated, concentrating them with um, ultrafiltration. Doing that, what we're able to do is to follow them or track them into the scaffolds, as you can see here by the 800 nanometer um, channel in which you can see that the EVs are present inside of the scaffold. This way we can track them and also um, evaluate again if either the pericardial or myocardial scaffolds would be uh, better, better suited for, uh, uh, as a scaffold for EV delivery. As you can see here, um, taking account this is a log scale, we could see that the pericardial scaffolds were the ones um, be uh, were the best for um, EV loading as they would retain a higher number of EVs. Myocardial scaffolds would actually be saturated earlier. And uh, both scaffolds were able to release these EVs as we could see by whole um, scaffold ferromagic scanning as you can see here in the images um, after a week. What we did next was to scale up these scaffolds. So we did a patch of one centimeter by two centimeters uh, wide. And what we did was to um, load it with either a hydrogel alone or a hydrogel with um, near infrared stained EVs. We would implant these two types of scaffolds into um, in a blindly randomized manner, 30 minutes after the um, myocardial infraction induction by ligation of the coronary artery. And then we would follow the um, person scanning um, seven days after to see where the EVs would be. What we could see is that if you take, this would be a whole heart of uh, one of the treated pigs. And even though that there is, um, as you can see here, where the star is, that, that's where the ligation of the artery would be. As you can see, um, there is tissue that is covering the scaffold as it's been integrated into the tissue, but still we could see the signal coming from the EVs that are in the scaffold underneath. When doing the slices of the different um, sections of the heart, as you can see here, we could see the signal of the EVs in the scaffold, but most importantly, and specifically in the MI core, indicating that these EVs would be delivered specifically into the um, infarct um, area. Um, importantly, the scaffold was actually integrated into the tissue, as you can see here on, on the right, and uh, the scaffold was not only integrated, let's say, um, macrostructurally, but also functionally. As we could see here in red, vessel, de novo vessel formations and also new nerves that would be crossing the scaffolds towards the myocardium. This was actually already known, let's say, by our group, as we could see both vessel and also nerve formation in scaffolds that were implanted either alone or in the presence of mesenchymal stem cells. Then we wanted to know if these EVs had an, an, a functional effect. And what we could see as different was that the level of um, vascular density was actually a lot increased um, when EVs were present in the scaffold. In terms of infiltration, we could see a very, uh, a very strong decrease in the number of CD163, so macrophages infiltrating the infarct core of treated animals. And in terms of uh, lymphocytes, we could see uh, no difference in terms of B cells, but a much decrease in the number of uh, T cells that were infiltrating the, the infarct area. In terms of uh, activation, so in terms of um, C25, C3 positive um, T cells, we could not see uh, no differences. And well, we looked at it because uh, when MSCs would be um, used for treatment of, of MI in, in pigs, we did see a reduction of, of activated 
decent infiltration in the MI area in previous studies. So as a summary, what we could see is that these EVs are able to reduce inflammation, promote angiogenesis, and recruit endogenous MSC and endothelial cells. Then we can use this engineered cardiac graft um, for local delivery into the uh, myocardial infarction scar in the pig model. And after seven days, um, we can track them. They actually go into the MI core where they reduce inflammation, both macrophage and T cell infiltrate, and they promote vasculogenesis. But then what happens in the long term and does it have an effect on the cardiac function, which actually was the main concerns of all the reviewers that actually looked at our paper. All these is possible thanks to the collaboration of these um, two groups, the group of um, Dr. Antoni Vallès Janis um, uh, from the um, German Stasi Pujol um, Hospital, and also the group of Francesc uh, Borras, and both groups are working in the German Stasi Pujol Research Institute. Um, thanks to all the funding agencies, thanks for all you, for the attention and for both um, initiatives from ISEP and Hedex. And now, if you have any questions, I'll be delighted to answer. Thank you very much, Marta. Very excellent presentation and also the results and pioneer in the in the use of BCBs already in the in the in the therapy. Well, let's say it's very, very, very impact. Thank you. So now time for questions. I mean Nasser is asking about the the how the, the what, what are the signaling factors that are in the reducing the inflammation uh, and increasing the regeneration? What do you think that you are uh, the, the, in the EVs that you are managing? What will be the, the molecules? Yeah, yeah, that's a very interesting question actually. Um, we are we did look at the different um, so proteomics profile, for instance, of the Wharton's jelly, so the umbilical cord work that we did with with human samples. We did see a few um, uh, potential um, uh, proteins uh, mediating these effects. Um, nevertheless, we know that the different content, so both either it's, if it's RNA or it's protein, it's not just going to be one factor, but a combination of them um, producing these effects. As we know that they are not only immunomodulatory, they are not only modulatory towards T cells. Actually, we see that they are towards T cells in vitro, but they are towards monocytes um, in vivo. We know that they are angiogenic, but they also produce the recruitment. So I don't believe there's just one factor, but a combination of a lot of them. So we have a lot of work in front of us. Um, so yeah. in short, oh, I don't know, but we do have promise. hints of the different functions. Very, very promising, yes. We have another question from Mahmoud Khan. So, how, how, how uh, is asking how long are the EVs retained in the scaffold? Yeah, so uh, we know for sure that after a week, at least, um, they are retained in the scaffold as we've done the uh, photometric assays, uh, at least in vitro for sure. And in vivo, we do see signals still in the scaffold um, after a week from implantation. And uh, what's the dose of the EVs? Uh, we implant EVs. EVs coming from 20 million um, MSC and producing EVs um, after 48 hours. So we always take our doses, taking into account the amount of producing cells that we have in the culture. So you're going to use the amount of you know, EVs coming from the cells. So you're saying 20 yep. million EVs. It's a great piece of data. One other question that I have, and I think a lot of folks in this uh, panel might have, is the model that we are using is an MI model. That is 30 minutes of ischemia, you know, and then mm -hmm. we're just putting this back. Rather, in a model where we already have a scar. So that would be much better to, you know, analyze what would happen if there is already a scar. Like, for example, if you're going to transplant this one week following an MI, that would be mm -hmm. more of a translational model. So what would be the response that you might think this could have in yeah. terms of cardiac function? Yeah, 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 it's a very good point. So um, we wanted to know if this had uh, uh, any op any potential for, for patients that just had a very large um, MI scar because um, the patients arriving to the hospital, you can already know which, um, how is the extent of the injury um, right after the, um, when, well, they are admitted to the hospital. Um, but you're right that um, in a lot of cases, it's rather a chronic 
um, scar the ones that you would treat uh, in the patients actually in the phase one clinical trial that I just mentioned in which we put the um, scaffolds with the mesenchymal stem cells. What we are treating right now uh, in the phase one study are chronic patients that undergo a bypass surgery. And so we, um, we put the scaffold at the same time that they undergo the bypass, not to do any extra surgery to these patients. So far, we know that it has some effect. So I would uh, say that also in the chronic um, patients, it would have some effect. But yeah, you're right that the next thing that we are thinking about doing is um, doing this same approach, but in a chronic model of, of MI in pigs. And that would mean to apply the, the, the scaffold two weeks after the MI. Last Another day. thing that we're thinking as well is to um, use the EVs in terms of um, uh, uh, in, injecting them in the intracoronary administration rather than the scaffold in, the, in these acute patients and then using the scaffold for chronic patients. One of the challenges with EVs is that they are retained for a very short time in, into area wherever you're injecting them. So do you have, are you planning any strategies that could enhance their delivery for a longer period of time? Because that's a major impediment to the field right now. Yeah, so um, our hypothesis is that although they have a very short lifespan, as you say, in vivo, as they would be taken up quite um, rapidly, um, we believe, as we also show in vitro, that they are able to recruit the endogenous cells, and that's why we wanted to make sure that this happens. Uh, so a, our hypothesis would be that once injected, once administered, what they do is to trigger these endogenous um, uh, repair mechanisms. So you might need repeated infusions, for instance, if you are doing a systemic administration, mm -hmm. but we believe that even though they would, let's say, disappear from our eye, they are already doing effects and they would trigger the endogenous mechanisms that are there, but they are not triggered, they are not active. And with the EVs, you do just this um, for it to, um, to regenerate. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So I have a question, Marta, regarding how, how, how because you have the scaffold and the scaffold, how the exosome or the vesicle go out of the of the of this scaffold? Do you have any idea how they by diffusion or maybe an active or maybe they are so trapped that it's more complicated? I don't know that part of the how is released from the scaffold. Yeah. So um, the 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 EVs would be in the scaffold, and we are sure that it um, that do they, they also so um, um, let's say. Uh, mix with, uh, not, not mix, but um, how do you say? So they interact, that's it, uh, with the scaffold itself. So as if they are interins, they are, there's ECM that is able to interact with the interins and so on that are in the EVs, but mainly they would be into the scaffold because of the hydrogel that is in this gel form. Once implanted in vivo, the hydrogel, it's also biodegradable. So once okay. and the cells are recruited into there, all this um, degradation of the gel will allow for the vesicles to get out really? from the scaffold. That's, that's the first thing. And the second thing is that actually my hypothesis is that uh, after a week when we see the EVs in the MI area, um, it's not that much because of the EVs go into the MI area, but because they recruit cells, these cells actually get the EVs, get they them. uptake them, and then these cells, as they are activated for regeneration, they migrate where they are needed, which is the MI core. And actually, we did see EV signal, so from the near infrared labeling in the MI core, but we cannot assure that these are free EVs. Um, I would actually hypothesize that they are um, cells that have taken the EVs, went into the MI area to regenerate or repair the tissue. And in, but most importantly, we did not see signal anywhere else in the, in the heart and uh, not in any other tissue. Okay, we have another question from Bu, Bu Hong San. Oh, hi. Um, thank you. Excellent hi. work. Um, so you mentioned about the component of the EV, right? I, I, I'm, I'm sure everybody wonder about that. How uh, have you tried to identify whether they're exosomes or micro um, or vesicles of uh, apoptic bodies or it, it was not a consideration? Yeah, 
Yeah, thanks. Very good question. So in our case, we use a discretion chromatography. Uh, so we know that they are EVs. Um, it's a mix of exosomes and microvesicles as well. And um, mesenchymal stem cells are known to produce both. Uh, and we, um, we don't know which one it is. And uh, right now, we are not so much interested in knowing if it's the exosomes or if it's the microvesicles, but we know that they are vesicles also by the cryo-electron microscopy and all the markers that we analyze. And in terms of apoptotic bodies, um, we do the um, previous runs of centrifugations at 400 and, 200 and 2000 Gs to be able to get rid of the cell debris and uh, big apoptotic bodies that would be there. Uh, at the same time, we know that there would be apoptotic bodies as you have in any cell culture in which you don't have any phagocytes getting rid of the dead cells and debris. So we know there are, but we also know that there are very few as the um, cell viability is always higher than 95% uh, for sure. So I would say that mainly our EV, um, so um, accessory vesicles um, or um, exosomes or microvesicles, um, and they are both for sure. So very nice talk, Marta. Congratulations. Thank you. So I work on a skeletal muscle, and I'm doing uh, systemic uh, injections. And I'm finding that also there is a, an increase on the uptake when you injure the skeletal muscle. So do you have, given that you said that uh, in the case of your, of your model, you don't see uptake uh, other than on the on the injured area, do you have any explanation for that happening? Because on the injured tissue, I have an increase on the on the muscle function, but on the injured one, it's like way way uh, way way better. So, do you have any any function because any any explanation for that? Yeah, do you yeah, think very that very nice question. question. Of macrophages. Like of the immune response that adds at the chemo, chemo tract, I don't know, a gradient or something, something like that. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. So in our case, uh, we decided to go for local administration to increase the dose and also to for the EVs to be more readily available in where they are needed the most, which is the MI core. And that's why we put this scaffold right like a band-aid. Um, so in top of, of the scar. And what we believe is that as the scaffold integrates to the tissue, it allows for either macrophages or um, other um, progenitor endothelial cells, um, mesenchymal stem cells, and so on, to go there, grab the EVs, and then either they go into the MI area because it's the one with more inflammation, so more chemokine and um, recruitment factors, so they go there, or the EVs also get attached there or with the um, activated endothelial cells that we know that they express more um, and integrins and adhesion molecules as they also receive these inflammatory factors. So I would say that if you, um, if you are um, administering the EVs by uh, systemic infusion, they would go either to the lungs and livers as we know by just um, physical um, treatment because it's the first place they go and they are all the capillaries yeah. Yeah. or to the um, activated endothelial cells as they would express more um, um, adhesion markers and so on. So they would be the same effect as you would have with activated endothelium and, and, uh, and then with um, rolling leukocytes and so on for externalization. So I would hypothesize with the same effect. Okay, thank you, Martha. Okay. Marta, I have a question for you, and it, it relates to what might be happening, not, not in the heart, not at the site, but, but rather elsewhere. So do you have mm -hmm. any evidence that any of these EVs are, are leaking out into the bloodstream or um, maybe winding up elsewhere? And I, I just ask that because of the possibility of immune recognition um, over time and whether, whether you think that that might be uh, something that you will observe as you go into a more chronic uh, model. Yeah, that's a very nice question. So um, uh, in, in terms of the systemic effect, what we hypothesize is that, and we have seen also, is that there is a change um, locally in terms of the inflammatory response. So we do see a change in the chemokines expressed locally. 
and so and also a change in the inflammatory factors produced locally and that would explain why then we see a, a difference systemically as the cells would uh, react or respond um, to different amounts or different um, chemokines that are produced. So if you have less inflammation and less recruitment locally, you would have less cells coming into the tissue, so you would have less recruitment or rush into the in the bloodstream. Um, that, that, that would be our, our explanation rather than leaking of EVs into the bloodstream. And the second question was, sorry. About um, possible immune responses. Yeah. Yeah, so um, so far, and um, we've seen that also with mesenchymal stem cells and their um, secreted EVs, they don't have um, much, um, um, so they don't have MHC um, class two. They do have a bit of MHC class one. So we don't expect much of an uh, recognition. And in terms of um, immune response, we see that they are actually able to reduce this um, immune response, but not to produce um, uh, any type of, of again, uh, reactivity or, or, or increase um, immune response. We've also done some um, repeated doses um, um, experiments in mice, and we have seen no reactivity or no allergy or no, um, um, yeah, like adverse reaction um, arising from high doses of EVs in a repeated fashion. So I would, vote for no. <laughs> okay, well, that sounds good and, and very certainly very promising for taking this then into the, into the clinic into some human patients. So Marta, thank you so much for this work and for sharing it with us. And I look forward to seeing everybody again very soon at another edition of the Extracellular Vesicle Club. So thank you. Thank you. And take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you.